Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, welcome to this seminar, which is the second in the series. Um, it's quite a new series, Evidence into Policy and Practice, which we launched earlier in the year. Um, it, all these seminars are recorded and live streamed, so uh, we are being recorded and filmed today. Um, and today we're going to be looking at social network analysis. Um, my name is James George Lackis, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Director of Communications and Impact uh, here at the Institute of Development Studies. And uh, I will introduce our panellists in a moment. Just to explain, we are a panellist down. Unfortunately, Catherine Oliver had a bit of a family emergency to attend to, so she can't join us. But we do have our three panellists, one of whom, Nazreen Jassani, is not sat here in front of you because she's actually in Joburg and she is joining us by uh, the magic of the internet. Um, so why have we focused this seminar on social network analysis? Well, uh, my own sort of experience or interest in it started a couple of years ago. Uh, I worked with, uh, as part of the Impact Initiative, which is a programme funded by the ESRC and DFID and the IDS, we produced this book, which you can get online for free, uh, The Social Realities of Knowledge for Development, which was essentially a load of case studies from researchers uh, writing about how they try to get their, their research evidence to influence policy and practice. And when we looked across the various case studies, and one of, one of my co-editors actually was Nazreen, who's going to be speaking on this panel, when we looked across the very, very diverse experiences people had had of trying to co-produce research with partners and get that research to have an impact beyond academia, the big thing they all had in common was this idea of the central importance of individual relationships. People, personalities, trust, who you know, how you know them, how you work with them, how you can extend those relationships. It was central to every single case study we looked at. And so since then, I've really thought a lot about the, the whole process of research uptake and impact as a relational process. Uh, and I have come from a comms background, so I used to think it was mainly a technical process. If we could just get those pesky academics to write in clear English and we could do better policy briefs and, you know, we could do better things with the internet and make research data more widely accessible, everything will get better. But it became apparent to me, and I'm not the only one, uh, that relationships is really the important thing. Um, and when we wrote the concluding chapter for that book, which I wrote with Nazreen and others, we said, well, if it is all about relationships, then in order to understand how research can have more impact on development, we're going to have to use things like social network analysis. And at the time, I hadn't quite realised quite how many people were already doing that. And uh, it's a very mature field. Um, so what is social network analysis? This is not a workshop on social network analysis, and I'm not going to stand here and attempt to give you a blow-by-blow -blow description. But um, just out of interest, could I have a show of hands? Who here has used or dabbled at all with social network analysis in their work. Right. So a real mix. Unfortunately, we can't see what the people online are doing with their hands, but I would imagine it's a similar kind of thing. About a third of us have, have used SNA in some shape or form, and the rest of you uh, are, 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 are yet to do so. I mean, very simply, social network analysis, it comes from sociology, and it helps you investigate the connections between things. Quite often it's between individuals, it doesn't have to be between individuals, it can be between individuals or institutions, but it helps us to map those connections, how are people connected, what connects them, how do they interact. And um, it's ended up being a, 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 an approach that's used by just about everybody for just about everything. Historians will use social network analysis because they want to know, I don't know, what, what, what made your marriage proposal most likely to be successful if you were a nobleman in 17th century Florence? You know, you, use such, you can use social network analysis to try and find that out. Political scientists use social network analysis. Computer scientists use it. But in development, what, we're really what I'm really interested in, and hopefully some of you are interested in, is how you can use it to understand what that connection between research, knowledge and evidence is with broader behaviours and policy and practice. So the title of this session was 
can social network analysis explain how research is constructed and used? And what I'm kind of hoping is we've got very different experiences of how social network analysis has been used today from our three panelists. And I guess what I'm hoping to get from it, and I hope what all of you kind of are able to go away and think about is, okay, what's the, what is the implications of this for my own work? How might I be able to make better use of this? And also, what are its limitations? What can't it do for me? So that's why we're here. I'm going to introduce the panellists in the order that they're going to speak. So our first speaker is Jordan Chilingirian, and Jordan is a lecturer at the University of Bath, um, and he studies British think tanks, amongst other things. So he's really interested in the role of think tanks and policy research institutes and how they affect the flow of knowledge and the perceived legitimacy of knowledge. Um, and he's used social network analysis, as he will explain, to map the changing social social world think tanks inhabit and to understand the cross-professional intellectual teams which constitute this space. Uh, and his wider interests relate to policy making and intellectuals and relations between social science and public policy and he holds a PhD in social and political sciences from the University of Cambridge. Uh, also, if you were to do some mini social network analysis on the people in this room, you discover he's my supervisor, which is also why you have to be very nice to him when you ask him questions later. Um, then we have uh, Louise, Louise Clark from IDS. Uh, Louise uh, works in our uh, knowledge impact and policy team here at the Institute, um, and she leads that team's work on monitoring and evaluation, uh, both in terms of programs, research programs, but also she leads the work IDS does on thinking how to monitor and evaluate its performance and its, its strategy uh, as, a, as, a, as an institution. Um, and prior to joining IDS, Louise worked as a male professional for over 10 years and worked for the likes of Oxfam America, ActionAid International, and as an independent evaluator. And during her PhD, she developed an innovative approach to use of social network mapping to visualize information flows related to agriculture value chains in rural municipalities of Bolivia. And then last not but lit not least, Nazreen, who you can't see yet, or maybe you can see her, I don't know. There she is. I've been told there might be a time delay, but um, hi, Nazreen. So, um, uh, Nazreen uh, Jasani, who I mentioned I work with on, on this book, Nazreen is at the faculty, is faculty at John Hopkins School of Public Health focusing on the nexus between health policy and systems research, uh, innovations in evidence-informed policy and practice, and the relationship between academia and public policy. So she's based in Johannesburg, where she is now, and she provides capacity strengthening to support to the WHO's partners globally um, on knowledge translation to schools of public health in East Africa. And she's also vice chair of the evidence to action thematic working group of health, them, health systems global, which of course IDS is very involved with. And previous to all of that, she was based in Kenya working for IDRC. So thank you very much for all joining us. So I'm gonna uh, be quiet now and ask Jordan uh, to kick things off and talk us a little bit about his work with social network analysis, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm John Chilingirian and I'm from the University of Bath from the Department of Social and Policy Sciences. Um, and as James has already said, um, I'm not, I don't, I don't I'm, I'm not from the development studies. Um, I, I study, uh, well, a very interesting group called uh, of Westminster based think tanks. Um, and my current research is, is, is interested in, uh, is this community in crisis at the moment? So what I'm going to be presenting today is sort of uh, not my current research, but sort of things that have been, have been bubbling over for the last couple of years, just to give you an insight into how I've used network approaches and relational approaches um, to study this community. Um, uh, so my, um, my research, I, I sort of think it, uh, I'd like to think it's, uh, it's a slightly different from traditional approaches to think tanks. Um, I'm a sociologist of knowledge, um, sociology of intellectuals. That's the, that's the, the, the sort of field that I'd situ situate myself in. Um, but when you look at the way think tanks have been researched, you know, not just in the UK, um, across the world, they sort of fit into three 
broad type. So there's the sort of historical case studies of these organizations, where they came from, why they're smaller in one country and bigger in other countries, why there's more of them in one country, and so on and so forth. Um, then there's an approach which I call the ideological ballistics approach, which is where you maybe look at a case study of organizations and say, okay, we know that this policy happened, and we know that there were these organizations at the time, and can we trace maybe the sort of the, uh, you know, we know that they had this idea, and can we sort of trace the impact of that idea on important, uh, you know, important political actors? Um, and you usually see, you know, so for example, what was the impor uh, importance of think tanks on uh, the rise of the third way in the UK, or the, uh, uh, the uh, impact of think tanks on Thatcher's thinking, or so on and so forth. These are the types of questions that, that people will ask. Um, and then there's thousands and thousands and thousands of studies on individual policy domains, be it cultural policy, education policy, that put think tanks in as another actor. They're somewhere, you know, they're just, they're part of the mix. Um, sometimes the paper will be about the think tank in that space, or it might be about the space, and then the think tank's mentioned. Um, my, so my research is, is, is slightly different to that. Um, I'm interested in how think tanks create knowledge. I'm interested in them as case studies of contemporary intellectuals. I'm interested in them because they are in a shady space, somewhere between media, university, uh, political fields, uh, and, and the economic field as well. I'm interested about this sort of shady space of intellectual uh, knowledge production. Um, and because of that, what I'm interested in is this, uh, there's a sort of theoretical problem. And it's because this theoretical problem, which is uh, up there as the problematic of allegiance, this is why I came to network analysis in the first place. Because when you start to think about policy knowledge, when you think about intellectuals that work between these, these uh, developed professions, um, questions start to arise about them. Um, and the problematic of allegiance is something that goes all the way back to sort of the first ever uh, claims within the sociology of knowledge. And that is, you know, who are the intellectuals? It's a methodological and a moral problem. So uh, methodological, it's uh, who are they? Can we bind them? Can we find them and put a nice, neat bow around them and say there is a group? But there's also the moral problem. Are they trustworthy? Are they critical? Are they real intellectuals? And we see a similar tension in the study of think tanks and in the study of policy knowledge in general. So methodologically, you know, is the Institute for, uh, for Physical Studies the same as the Adam Smith Institute? They're both seen as think tanks. Are they completely different? Are they the same? Are they the same types of organizations? Um, and then there's the moral one as well. Are they real experts? Uh, are they just hacks? You know, should we trust them? Should we care about them? Should our institution be named a think tank and should we be worried about that? These are the types of questions that, that emerge. And that's why I sort of turned to, to network analysis, because I'm not the first person to have used relational methods, uh, you know, social network analysis or relational theories to study think tanks. Um, so this is a, the space that we can say think tanks occupy, the sort of interstitial space. And this is based on the work of Thomas Medbert. So this is not my, my diagram, I should say that. Um, Epistemic community uh, theory, uh, when it's applied to think tanks, it positions, it positions these organizations as uh, you know, something closer to the expert. It ties them to, it uses networks to tie them to uh, the, the field of knowledge production or academia. At the same time, neo Gramscian approaches uh, that are quite dominant in the study of think tanks tie or tie think tanks to the political field. They're interested in the role of the think tank as being the organic intellectual of the party or the political party project. So it defines intellectual labor, knowledge production, evidence production through service to the party. Um, and then what we find in more power structure research is that, uh, so this is sort of, you know, the sort of classic um, American studies, uh, which look at sort of an integrated um, elite of uh, business and political, uh, the business, business political class, that we see that uh, think tanks again are sort of seen as handmaidens to this class, and it links them closer to the economic and political field at the same time. I want to say that none of these approaches are wrong. I think they're all. They're, they only can't have really three sides of the same coin, but they're all sort of. They are. I would say that we have to have an approach which links them all together. So it's not a problem of network analysis, and it's not saying that if you study networks automatically, you're, you have to fall into one of these camps. It's more about the issue, the issue really of the question is what networks are you looking for, and, who, and where, what's your starting point? So rather than starting from each individual field, I decided to start from the center, so from the think tanks themselves. Um, 
So I decided to follow think tanks, uh, follow think tank researchers, and follow the research process. So what does that mean? Um, so I've broadly called this uh, a sociology of dynamic interventions. Um, so these are the networks that policy intellectuals create as they're going about doing what they're meant to do, creating knowledge. Um, so it's these, it's, so it's, what are these networks they draw upon to make interventions into the public sphere or into the political debate or into the ear of the important uh, uh, minister or politician or advisor? Um, so I focus on, so I gather my relational data from the things that intellectuals, think tank intellectuals produce. So it's the papers, it's the lectures, it's the blog. It could be even a piece of art if you're interested in that. Um, it's the things that intellectuals create and the networks that converge onto making these. So these are emergent networks. They're the networks that the intellectual creates, draws upon. They might be old, uh, old, uh, very close ties. They might be new, uh, new ones they've just created for a particular project. And I try and bring these together. So what was the actual approach that I've, I've, uh, I've been using to study think tanks? Well, I take a mixed method approach. Um, and you'll sort of see as I come towards the end why I think that's important when you're looking at knowledge production. Um, but I was looking at policy documents, official networks that were, that were available to me through uh, the policy documents. So when we've seen that the people co-author together, when we see that there's a, a co-funder between, uh, between think tanks based on who they disclose in their, uh, in their policy reports. Um, and uh, so the majority of the data I have is from 2005 to 2012, but now I've got more from 2013 uh, all, the way up to, uh, up, all the way up to 2018. Um, and whilst I was using their documents, I was also using organisational websites, um, you know, social media, uh, social media sites, LinkedIn, Wikipedia, just where I can find extra information about these organisations. And also interviews, interviews about individual researchers, personal networks, the networks that they draw upon and the ones that they use. Um, so what did this allow me to do? So I'm, I'm going to give you three broad we we'll not necessarily call them findings, it's just more sort of, because if I was to give you the findings, we'd have to go into too much detail, but just sort of what I think this has allowed me to, to understand or to, 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 get a, to, to get a hold of. Um, the first is that taking this approach has allowed me to focus on the structure of the think tank community. So what do I mean by that? Well, it's allowed me to look at issues of polarisation. How polarised is knowledge production in the UK? Are certain think tanks likely to share resources with other groups? Do we see uh, particular coalitions of organisations emerging? And is it based on ideological similarity? Or is it based on organisational similarity? Is it based on age? All these other types of attributes. It gives me an idea about how the knowledge, the, you, know, you could almost call it the knowledge regime of the UK is structured. So in the funding network using sort of, uh, statistical network analysis, I was able to work out that actually sharing an ideology and being part of a political project, i.e. not just being a left-wing think tank, but being a left-wing think tank which is associated with the Third Way project, um, uh, and having a similar organisational type was significant in sharing funders. You were, sort of, you were more likely to, uh, to share funders if you uh, had a similar ideology and were part of the same political project and also had, were the same organisational type. Um, again, in the authorship network, completely different. Actually, there seems to be no evidence of polarisation going on. There's not much, you know, there seems to be either a lot of sharing between different authors, uh, of authors, um, across the ideological spectrum and across the organisational spectrum, um, or actually there's just not much sharing. People keep to their own, to, within their own organisations. Completely different again when we went to the uh, shared advice network. Um, this was quite similar to the funding network. It seemed to be that be having the shared ideology and the, sh and the sharing of the same political project uh, was related to, uh, to sharing the same advisors. So more, uh, more left or more right wing organisations tended to share uh, similar sources of knowledge. So it gave me a bit of an idea of the relational structure of this community. Now, the next stage to that was uh, the, the, next, the next insight that was, uh, I, I was able to gain was what I, you could, I, I guess you could call resource mapping. So it's not just saying what's the structure of this community, but what things do they value? So it's not just enough to say, oh right, well, these types of organisations will share the same funder or the same advisor. But whose money is important to this group? 
whose knowledge is important to this group, what types of ideas are privileged, what ways of thinking um, are privileged by this community. And again, so quantitative social net network analysis allow me to say half, you know, a part of the story. Because when, you, when I was able to just count up the different types of advisors in this network, so this is the 2005 to 2012 network, it seemed to be that, oh yes, well, let's look at it. Think tanks talk to other think tanks. Um, and by, you, know, you could say quite a large amount compared to academics and then business professionals. Um, so does that mean that it's a, you know, does that mean that's the most valuable type of knowledge in this community? Um, similarly, when I was looking at the funders, private sector uh, funders and, or, or donors or, or sponsors, or, or if you want to be uh, mean, you could say controllers, um, were the most prominent uh, group. Uh, in, uh, you know, these were the most prominent types of organisations to be sending money to think tanks. But does that, just because we have private sector as the most, you know, the, the most numerous, does, it, do we, does that automatically mean that they hold the most prestigious spaces or the most uh, or positions or, or the most powerful positions within this uh, community? And this is what network analysis allowed me to at least well, try and find out. Because when you actually look at this is the funding network, this is just the core of the funding network. There are a lot, a thousand, a good, good few hundred more nodes uh, on, on the whole network. But actually, when you look at the most central actors, so that's the sort of horrible greeny ones at the center, they are the key uh, charitable trusts. Though private sector funders are the uh, most, uh, they, you know, there are more of them, think tanks want to be associated with core charitable trusts. They do not want to be associated with private sector funding. Um, it's, not as, it, it's valuable to them, but symbolically it might not be as valuable. Um, again, when we look at the, this is the advice network, um, there are certain, this is, and again this is just the core of the advice network, this is, it was actually a, a much, much larger network. Um, Certain individuals are uh, more central than others. And who are these people? They are people with more quantitative economic knowledge. Um, the most central people, the ones that the people that, if you, so be you a more academic think tank, be you a more political think tank, a left wing or a right wing think tank, these are the types of people you want to talk to. So again, it allowed me to do this sort of resource mapping and actually try and find out who or what, who or what resources are not just present, but what is valued. Um, and what are the characteristics uh, of the people in the course? So just thinking about the advice network. Um, what I also found is that think tanks don't, they're not just interested in uh, sort of the best academic, let's say. They're not necessarily interested in the person with the, the most publications um, per se. That's, that, could be, that could be helpful. But actually, when they're looking at academic knowledge, they don't just want the best uh, economist. They also want someone who is exposed to the political world at the same time. So what I sort of found is that uh, the sort of hybrid intellectuals within think tanks privilege hybrid knowledge. They want people that have had spent time in the treasury. They want, so you, an academic great, a clever academic, even better, a quantitative academic, brilliant, but have you been on uh, part of the select committee process? Have you been part of the, um, uh, have you been advised in the treasury? Were you a civil servant before? Uh, becoming an academic and so on and so forth. This is the type of uh, knowledge or the type of skills uh, that are vital or valued uh, within the think tank community. And on the other side of that, at the same time you had these sort of hybrid um, academic actors, you also had hybrid political actors. So it's not just that you were a member of a party, it's not just that you were central in a party, it's also that you've been part of a campaign organisation, it's also that you've been a special advisor at, the, uh, at some point in your career as well. So these, all these people having a sort of a more hybrid careers uh, seem to be much more important and valuable to this community. Um, but there are limits to the official network. Um, First thing is that if you disclose who your relationship, you know, relationships are valuable. Think about your own connections and how valuable they are to, for you to get things done. Um, when you disclose relationships, they're like a CV for these organisations. They are, when you're looking at these official networks, these are organisations saying, take me seriously. I'm, I am talking to the right people. Um, and it's part of their own self-positioning of, of legitimacy. Um, and there are always more people involved in the process of knowledge production and translation. So, and if you just focus on this quantitative network, you get a very, not, you don't get a flat view of uh, knowledge production, but you do get, the politics is taken out of it. So that's why I, half of my uh, work has been quantitative, but the other half has been qualitative. And actually looking about how people use these networks and create these networks. So. The other part of my research has been asking researchers to tell me the story of 
a recent project and to get me to move around their network qualitatively, for them to reconstruct the relationships where they can tell me about how they found the money, how they found the expertise, how they disseminated the ideas, who they went to. Um, I won't spend too long on this, but a lot of my, one of my recent uh, publications have been around how think tank intellectuals construct uh, credibility. How these, all, you know, if you fight, when you go to a lot of uh, think tank researchers, um, a good wedge of them might not have any expertise in the field that they are uh, actually writing on. Best quote I have from, from my PhD days was an interviewee who said, I've just got a, uh, I've got a, a BA in theology, but I'm writing about housing policy. How did that happen? Okay? You have these crises of credibility, not just from outside the community, but from the actors inside it as well. So how do they position themselves as, credi uh, as credible? And to do that, I was looking about how, the, how they enroll themselves into other networks. Um, I won't go into too much detail about it now, just for, just for time. Um, but just through talking to uh, individual researchers, I was able to sort of see the interplay between the social capital of very senior staff compared to that of very junior staff. Very senior staff seem to have net, uh, networks which go across the whole community. So they will have the, the sort of top end relationships with uh, people in the media, within business, within academia, within, um, within politics. But the junior researchers have very deep networks which go into one particular field. And the two are sort of meshed together to make a publication. So the director will say, you should talk to these five people. And from talking to those five people, the junior researcher can dig down deep. And those relationships become part of the wider organisational uh, you know, organisations as a reserve of social capital. Um, and the other thing is symbolically how these different, how these networks bring in different forms of capital and legitimacy. So by a uh, think tank researcher going out and making good friends with the right academics, they can use those uh, connections and the sort of the symbols of the, of the academic field as a way to buffer themselves against uh, influ uh, either, either influence from funders or perceived influence of funders. So it's part of the sort of, as the quote in, in the middle says, the dance of policy research. So that's broadly uh, a quick uh, run through of how I've been using social network analysis and not just from a quantitative perspective but from a qualitative perspective. Um, and the story, when you look at these stories, they make us think again about what these networks are. Um, so it forces us, when we take a qualitative perspective, and put it, and, and, or I should say mixed method perspective, um, it really points out to us that these networks aren't pipes or tubes, that knowledge doesn't just flow through um, a connection. Um, it's a process of translation. It's mucky. It's murky. What you put in might come out quite different at the other end. Um, and that these ties that think tanks and policy researchers create, I call partial connections. Um, they are not. They are never. They, they are never sort of static for a long time. Because the whole point is about to be a, a legitimate policy researcher. It's not to be the best academic, but it's to be academic enough so you can show your legitimacy to the academic community while showing your legit legitimacy to the policy community and so on and so forth. So it's, it helps it helps uh, to map that sort of dynamic process. Um, and if I was to sort of sum up very briefly, um, taking a relational approach to think tanks uh, isn't new. What I think that I, my work has been doing is to the, the, to the types of networks I've been focusing on are. Um, and this offers a, an alternative to traditional relational approaches to the study of think tanks uh, and policy researchers. Um, it takes seriously that think tanks are a hybrid community. So by starting with the networks that think tanks create, we can see how they cross all these different professions. Um, and of course, I've been going on about how mixed method SNA, uh, you know, the importance of bringing the narrative to the network is vital. Um, the only thing I could say about my approach, maybe it might be a bit too British. It might be that these organisations have a certain publishing culture which allows me to follow those networks. Um, and I've used it uh, in, in a cross-sectional uh, study. Uh, this is uh, longitudinal data, but, it is, uh, but it's been treated as a, cro a cross-sectional study, which is problematic. And uh, I can, if you invite me back next time, I can tell you about my more longitudinal stuff. Um, but it's also produced a rich database of organisations and individuals, which can be studied in a lot more detail. But thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Jordan. So uh, we can have questions when all the panellists are presented, but I quickly want to ask you one question. Yes. Is IDS a think tank? 
What would you say? <laughs> um, it depends who's calling you a think tank, and uh, uh, I would say yes, you are. There because you a think tank could exist in, in, in any place. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll come back to that. So now for something slightly different. Very Louise. Different. Um, okay, great. Um, I'm hopefully online. This is... Um... Okay. Uh, right, I just wanted to check that that was working, and I can just I can introduce it now. But the the, the connect, connectivity was a little bit slow. So, um, as James said, I'm I'm here at IDS, uh, the monitoring evaluation learning manager. Uh, I've been working uh, with social network analysis for about 15 years now, which is quite scary, um, and it's changed a lot. Um, as James mentioned, I did my PhD um, working with rural farmers in Bolivia. Um, and we developed social network analysis then as very much a kind of quick and dirty diagnostic as something that could give us you know, a very quick overview snapshot of some of the relationships um, when we were going into communities. Um, so that's very much sort of influenced my, my, my network analyzing as I've moved forward. I'm very much a visual mapper, um, although you know there's a whole metrics and mathematical, um, and it's, it's really interesting because having been in this field now for such a long time, uh, you know, 15 years ago it was all about the algorithms and the maths and the betweenness and the centrality and all the, the, the kind of very um, mathematical formulaic debate. And the visualization has really kind of caught up if not taken over in that time as, and, and lots of people are, are playing around with um, you know this this idea of just understanding um, what we mean when we're talking about networks as they've become more and more ubiquitous in um, every area of our life so um, the data I'm going to share with you today um, I've actually got two um, two pieces two two different presentations uh, that both have come out of um, a meeting that we ran as the impact initiative IDS led project um, that is supporting so essentially the project is supporting uh, an ES two ESRC and DFID funded portfolios of research one is the joint fund which has approximately 180 different grants in it, working all around the world on gender, health, resilience, you name it. It's, if it's got a poverty focus, it's possibly in there. Um, and also a more um, focused um, portfolio on education, which aren't actually included in this data set. Um, so this, is, this data is, has all come out of a meeting that we ran in Delhi in December last year, so it's all quite fresh, um, and, I'm, and I'm still playing around with it. but. Um, the idea basically is to show you two different angles of network analysis. Firstly, the kind of the, the, the quite straightforward relational mapping between, um, in this case, the delegates at a meeting, but also um, some work that I'm exploring around kind of more using it more for systems mapping um, and looking at sort of two mode networks, which um, is an area that I've always found really quite useful. Uh, so going to this hairball, um, so this um, is a software called Kumu, um, which is great because it actually does have a function called hairball, <laughs> uh, which you can probably see why. Um, and basically what we did, uh, this, was the, this is the converse, this is, these are the relationships between our 100 and over 100 delegates that came to our meeting both before and after, and I'm going to talk you through a little bit how this is, is broken down. Um, essentially, we used a, an online tool called SumUp, which um, basically presented everyone with a list of everyone else that was going to be at the conference. Um, and just by clicking simply on a link of the other delegates, they could answer a drop-down box to tell us how they all knew each other. So it was, you know, for me, was a, this was a real revolution in terms of how you get the data um, to do this network analysis. And also, given that we were at a, a conference, it had a double effect of helping people to know who else was at the conference. Um, and, you know, as we see, people know each other by name, but they don't necessarily know what each other look like. And the, the focus on this, the, 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 the meeting was called the power of partnership. So it really was, the emphasis was on building relationships. So we weren't just mapping the relationships 
for mapping the relationships sake, although it was nice to get a nice, um, a ni an, an interesting data set out of it, but it was really about emphasizing the, the people that we were there to build connections and it was all about how, who you knew and how you knew and, and that it was how you were going to use these connections moving forward. So this is like the, 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 the hairball um, diagram which doesn't really tell us <coughs> anything apart from the fact it was a really great event there was lots of people and and they all got on really well <coughs> sorry <coughs> um, so in order to sort of an, analyze this we, we look at it we can cut it in in very different ways so this is the connection of people um, who knew each other before the event so you're saying, well, you know, we're already this, the, the net, there is already a network there. Uh, these are people that have previously worked together. So we're already, we, you know, we're, we're building a, a con, upon quite a solid foundation. You can see there's a, a core of the IDS organizing team in the middle, um, the, the conference organizer up here. Um, and an interesting network around this corner of people who, who all know each other socially. So, you know, in terms of thinking around networks and how you strengthen relationships, um, understanding those, the different types of relationships that, that people have and who some of the kind of core influences are in this network. So that's, um, that's one view. Uh, and then this view, which is, um, much more partial is so these are people who ha, who are aware of each other's work so we're going to a conference I've read their paper oh that's really interesting I'm I, I, I'm, I want to follow up with that person I'm, I'm aware of their work but I um, don't know who they are um, and this is you know this is we know this is why as academics we go to these big international meetings um, and in many ways this data is telling us what we already know but it is providing us with empirical evidence and also importantly for us in the impact initiative kind of um, data that we can follow up on um, in, in, in terms of how we then strengthen and build these relationships moving forward and you know and, and to bring it back to the focus here with this focus on how you use evidence in, into the policy space uh, so this is our this is our kind of uh, <laughs> policy maker the, the guy from DFID who everyone like everyone really wanted to meet um, and funny when we get to everyone thought um, that every conversation he had would lead to some sort of follow up he had a slightly different view um, <laughs> Uh, so, so these are uh, people who, who are aware of each other's work, and then this is this is people who had been in touch. So we 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 already communicate, but we haven't actually met. So you know, this, there's a, there's a slightly stronger relationship there than in fact that they're going to know that each other are going to this meeting. They will probably have communicated around it, but um, so we, we you know there's there's understanding that this network already exists. Um, as you know, as part of my job as the monitoring and evaluation person, I have to try and measure how we're building relationships within this network. So um, actually, I have to know who knew each other beforehand to be able to demonstrate how, we've, how good a job we've done. Um, and then where this gets interesting, and I'm, I'm sort of having moving back into uh, the... Um, you know the, the the benefit of some of the metrics. So this is these are the these are the people that ha have been identified as the kind of the core brokers within that network. Um, so these are people who um, use a betweenness score. So betweenness in the, in the social network analysis metrics are people who have the shortest path between every other person in the in the network. So they can kind of act as a broker or a bottleneck. Um, and what's, what's quite interesting here is we do have, you know, some quite strong sort of triad relationships. So that's a really, you know, that those, those people are, are, are kind of core influencers within our network and people that we certainly want to kind of reach out to um, and have potential to work with us as champions um, and in, in building this kind of strong network around this reach, research portfolio um, and linking then to policy makers. Um, and there's our, our different guy again. So that's so. This is all. This is all without. This is all um, before we even did anything. Then everyone arrives in Delhi, and we've we've got another hairball because we had a great. You know, it was a great event. Three days, um, lots going on, um, and these are all the 
conversations. You know, this is just people, uh, yeah, well, cool, I was in a seminar. So we, we, we tracked a lot of relationships because we had this app and we were kind of constantly updating, constantly feeding back, and people were telling us. So one of the, one of the, one of the relationships was that we had a conversation. Nice to know, not really that useful. Uh, we all go to meetings and have conversations. So, you know, but we can, so we can take those all out, essentially, um, and focus much more on this network, which is much, much more interesting in terms of, these are all the people that told us they had a conversation. Oh, and they fell off the bottom of the screen. Uh, they had a conversation and they thought that that would possibly lead to some sort of follow-up. They'd identified an area where they would like to communicate together in the future. And there, there you can see very clearly everyone wants to collaborate with, with, our, with our friend from Diffid. Um, just a little note on the ethics of this, because in the era of GDPR, the, it's, a, it's a minefield for social network analysis. So we have actually asked people for their permission to use their names. Uh, and some of them didn't agree, so they're represented um, as numbers. But in terms of doing social network analysis, especially now using a, an online platform, that's something we need to consider. So this gives us a really interesting, and in terms of understanding some of these relationships um, and, and how we can, as a project, build this brokerage role. So you know, the, these are people who already have a brokerage role in the network. So that gives us an entry point to say, and how can we support them um, to, to, um, to, to strengthen these relationships um, and work together. Obviously, there's a lot of blue dots in there. Those are the grant holders. So one of the dynamics that we, you know, that we're constantly facing in the impact initiative is, you know, it's all very well building relationships within between grant holders, but how does that relate to the policy question? Um, but we're really interested in that, the, you know, the, the stronger that the way that grant holders work together and the more connections that they can see between their own research and the kind of the intersectionality between, for example, work that's come out of this um, uh, on um, transport and um, food security and, and matching different areas of research together. So I've just had the yellow card, so I will move quickly forward. And this is our, like, these are our key brokers. Um, essentially, so these are these are the, the key influencers. So that's all very exciting. But while we were there, we thought we'd, we'd you know, that that wasn't quite uh, enough. So parallel to that, uh, my team were also um, doing an outcome harvesting. So we were trying to understand uh, the impact and what is how do you understand impact across a research portfolio so this now is we're moving into more systems mapping uh, this is in in, in SNA speak a, a two mode or um, bimodal net uh, by bipartite network because you've got actors and you've got outcomes and so you're looking at how the different projects are clustered around the different outcome areas we did a, a, a sort of an ad hoc outcome harvesting exercise based upon the um, preliminary um, conference presentations that were shared with us and then as um, the uh, researchers were sharing their findings during the during the three days of the conference we were essentially collating the different types of outcomes and clustering them around these areas. Um, we, 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 you know, there's not much happening there, but also a lot of those grants are finished, so we're not really as much in touch with them. But we can look at how this develops over time, and these are the, the kind of the final phase of the of the uh, of the call who are who are currently live. And what we can do, we can sort of. So what we're exploring is now working with projects because we can look at each of their kind of causal pathways and try and understand through this um, through this data what are some of the pathways to impact across this portfolio um, and we're in the process now of going back to these grant holders and trying to kind of validate this and understand if this um, kind of resonates with with them um, and the impact pathways that they have developed um, but this kind of creates this sort of this sort of kind of what we described as the the delta of impact uh, because we were in Delhi and it, there was because there was multiple flows in and out it started as a river but got quite complicated um, and this 
was really useful because it helped us to identify two sort of distinct work streams around this, the, the kind of the research, the causal pathways. Firstly, this work around engaging with communities and the different types of outcomes that projects were reporting on their work with communities. The size of the <coughs> nodes relates to how often a project has been associated with this type of change. And then a sort of second kind of um, tributary, as it were, into, into our delta around a much more kind of formal research, um, building the body of knowledge, strengthening research communities, developing new tools. Um, but where these two areas really coalesced was around this idea of multi-stakeholder engagement, which really was kind of the heart and soul of this meta-impact pathway, and just demonstrating the importance of um, engaging with communities, engaging with policy makers, building building a relationship with media, uh, visual representations of data um, in order to shift norms and take us over to this sort of final area um, of the delta where you know, we were trying to understand policy impact and you know, what was re referred to as DFID as the, the kind of the, the hierarchy of impact. They, they want to see policy influence, but actually we're trying to break it down and, and demonstrate it's not that straightforward. There was a lot of discussion around how we had influenced policy discourse, much less around specific tangible influences on policy. Influencing multilateral institutions came up as a, as a quite a strong area and outcome um, for projects. And then, you know, the, the holy grail of, of both of, of impact on livelihoods, but being able to demonstrate that there was a contribution of the, you know, to trace it back to the research so that you had some tangible um, links. So that's, that's, uh, that's my five minutes probably. So, um, and that's back to the, back to the beginning, the, the beautiful Delta. Thank, thanks Louise. Um, yeah, I, I have to say, uh, we never thought with the impact initiative this kind of meta-analysis of path, impact pathways was going to come out of it, but it's fascinating and really interesting. So we're going to now move on before questions at the end to Nazreen in Joburg. Uh, Nazreen, can you hear me? Oh. I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Amazing. Okay, so we've got control of your slides and uh, you may begin. Excellent. So, hi everyone from Cyberspace. Um, sorry I can't be here in person, but hello to everyone that's in the room. I can see your backs. I can also see you screen of myself, so it's a bit uh, strange, uh, strange uh, but hello to everyone that's online as well. Um, so, I'm going to speak to you a little bit about a study on. In order to, in order to uh, minimize, uh, minimize the bandwidth, bandwidth issue that we have here in South Africa, as well as, Africa, as, as, well as the possibility of losing electricity anytime, I am going to take my camera off and share my screen with you so I will tell me if this works. And then after the presentation, I'm happy to um, come back online and speak with anyone that has questions if that works. So here we go. I'm going to take off the camera and share my screen and tell me if that works and if you can still hear. There we go. Okay, I'm going to move my view out of the way. Um, uh, that is working perfectly. I think that's is that working? working. Is that working? It's working perfectly, Nazarene. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, as I said, this is, it's, it's hard to speak after two phenomenal speakers with such exciting presentations, so I hope I can keep up. <laughs> So this is um, uh, a study that I did in Kenya a few years ago as I was, um, is it, I, I understand that's an echo, is that an echo? I got a message from a kind listener saying that there might be an echo. Uh, maybe online. Maybe online there's an echo. Is everyone in the room hearing me okay? Yes, that's right, I think you better continue. Okay, um, okay. Let's, um, let's hope that, let's hope that at least online it's not too much of a problem. Thanks for letting me know. Um, so this, uh, this study was really basically because I was curious uh, about finding empirically whether a gut feeling I had about academics, um, academic researchers playing a, uh, a hybrid role in terms of uh, fulfilling their academic 
uh, requirements um, in universities, but also finding ways to bridge the gap between knowledge and policy by engaging with decision makers. And really, what does that mean in terms of uh, their networks, their ability to influence policy, but what are the implications on academia? And I look particularly within schools of public health. And so I'll give you an overview of the research itself and then the wider implications, particularly in light of the SDGs and our discussions on multi-sectoral action for public health. So a little bit of background, um, universities are generally credited for building capacity, brokering partnerships in some cases, but also serving as bellwethers for innovation and discovery. But they do face new challenges now as these traditional roles of academia are beginning to evolve. And in public health in particular, this increasingly includes participation of communities, decision makers, implementers. So the research in this field has really been encouraging a symbiotic relationship between the bench sciences and the implementation sciences, thereby creating opportunity for academic institutions such as schools of public health to think about how they intersect um, beyond health to straddle other sectors such as education, labor, and economic sectors become more important. And finally, these emerging opportunities give rise then therefore to evolving roles um, and, and the necess necessity to be adaptable in those positions and create more flexible boundaries with respect to academia and their influence on decision making, whether at the level of policy, um, practice or the public. And so in thinking about um, these hybrid roles, and I hope this animation works, um, we're looking particularly at, and you might recognize The Simpsons, um, you know, on one side of what we think of as this um, huge divide and bridge between academic researchers and policymakers, do these hybrid individuals exist? And if so, um, how, how do we find them? How do we identify them? How do we support them? How do we leverage them? And so for this particular study, we define these academic knowledge brokers as academic faculty in schools of public health that are connected to policymakers as a conduit to policy influence, but also serve as advisors internally in the school of public health to their academic peers on advice with respect to evidence to policy, practice, and people. And so the, in, the study in Kenya, actually, um, we have a trilogy of papers that came out of this. And unfortunately, as you probably all know with research, you have to divide really interesting intersects in what you're learning into different papers. And so we do have multiple papers on looking at multiple aspects of this study. The first thing we did was map the networks. And this was um, using social network analysis. Once we identified knowledge brokers, we wanted to understand really their attributes, their capacities, and their skills. And we also wanted to understand, therefore, how are they engaging? What can we learn about the strategies for engaging with decision makers? So for today, I'm just going to focus on the first aspect, which is the SNA part of our study. But as you will see as I move forward, we did couple this as Jordan and Louise did in their studies with more, a more qualitative aspect. And so first, I'll give you a little bit of background into what the political context was in Kenya at the time that I was there, which was in 2013. <clears throat> I'm originally Kenyan um, by background and by birth. And so I went back to Kenya to do this study, particularly because of the passion and commitment I have to the country. And I was there during a really during a lot of political upheaval at the time. So in 2010, there was a new constitution that was rolled out, and it was requiring the devolution of power from the national government to the counties. In parallel, a couple of years later, in 2012, a new university act required that all universities revoke their existing charters and create new ones. And faculty at the time of the study were therefore really, really busy providing the relevant information for, for accreditation. And then in 2013, while I was there, all of this was happening in the background, but there were looming presidential elections. So that meant that policymakers were either busy with political party activities, or they were uncertain about their futures, or maybe both. And so it's quite likely that we were anticipating that whatever network map we, we find in terms of connections between academics and policymakers, 
are, is likely to be quite different just a few months down the, la- the line. And, and this is one of the, the exciting things, but also the limitations, I guess, of anything that has to do with some form of stakeholder analysis is it, it really needs to be a dynamic process. Um, this, you know, assuming that a static map at any point would be the same several months later is something that we need to be cognizant of. So because the, the, the academics in Kenya, many of which are affiliated with Uh, political parties, we're expecting that these looming elections were also requiring political party activities by several of the faculty that were involved in campaigns. So the advocacy role and their their political role was something that we also had to keep in the back of our minds as we were doing this study in terms of, you know, when we think about people wearing one hat, it's really not fair because, you know, there's many dimensions of people's lives that are influencing their their relationships, which which we found, and I'll speak more about that. So in terms of the academic context in Kenya, just some key facts to give you a little bit of background. Um, There were at the time 39 universities in Kenya, and of those there were six schools of public health. So, you know, in some countries this may be really small, for some countries this is really large. Five of these schools of public health had some kind of presence in Nairobi, either their their headquarters or their main um, building was in Nairobi and the satellite offices were in districts or the other way around. But five out of the six had some kind of presence in Nairobi. And this was really important for us to understand because obviously, as you can imagine, this drove the opportunity for those that wanted to have connections with decision makers or influence national decision making. That was really critical in terms of their geographic location. In terms of just an understanding that research uh, funding, there were about 16 to 30 percent of funding for research in Kenya was coming from non-governmental resources. So even though we were really interested in looking at relationships between the academic faculty and national government, there was this recognition that maybe not all the research was relevant or imported or funded by the government. And there's pros and cons to that. We also recognize that even though the study was confined to research evidence and researchers from academia, obviously there are many other academic bodies that existed in Kenya with respect to think tanks, like Jordan mentioned, in terms of um, non-governmental organizations, also the government itself has research institutes. And so that was all part of the larger understanding of the context with respect to academic research. This is just a table to give you an overview of the six different um, schools of public health that appeared at the time. As you can see, some had um, three, up, three and up to seven campuses across the nation. Some were created back in 1984, 1970. Some were a lot more recent than that. Um, Kenya Methodist University was est- uh, established in 1997. Some were public, some were private. All of these things were important for us to understand in terms of their ability to engage with decision makers. It was also important for us to know the size. As you can see, some of these had a total number of faculty of only 17 with a maximum of 34. So not huge schools of public health, unlike where I work at the moment at at, at Johns Hopkins University or at Stellenbosch University where I'm affiliated, which um, is a completely different ballgame. So this gives you a little bit of background on the variety of the schools of public health. And this was actually a census across all six. And so in terms of how we designed this study, it was similar to the ones you heard about earlier. It was a mixed methods sequential design. So we started off with the quantitative aspect, the SNA. And so we um, applied a sociometric survey across all schools of public health. In total, that only came up to a potential sample size of 157. Of the 157, we were actually able to speak to 124 faculty. So it ranged from about 75% coverage to about 95% across individual schools. But across our entire network, it was um, an 80% response rate, which we're really happy about. Um, In terms of the social network analysis itself, we spoke to each of these 124 faculty about listing all the the members in national government that they engage with in order to influence decision making. So not in order to invite you home for a dinner party because we grew up in the same um, village or district, but really with the intention to use that relationship to influence um, decision making. 
And what we did is um, then take those networks and use some of the measures that are quite um, natural to social network analysis in terms of measuring their out degree. So how many people are they connected to at the government? We measured their in degree. So how many people within, the, within their departments go to them for advice on evidence to policy. And then we also used the between the centrality measures. So we ended up using a composite score because we didn't find that any of these three individual metrics or indicators was able to provide us with the kind of identification of our knowledge brokers that we were looking for. And so we use those measures to identify our knowledge brokers, but also to do a visual mapping of where they appeared in the networks. We found that there were seven knowledge brokers that fit this criteria across the 124. And then what we did in the second phase of the study, which I won't go into, is then interview these seven knowledge brokers to understand what it is about them that makes them um, comfortable, uh, advantaged, or morally or ethically disposed to be able to do more of this engagement work. Um, but we also wanted to speak with those that don't engage with policymakers to understand why they don't engage. And we also wanted to speak to leadership at the universities to see what it is about the institutional environment that either supports or hinders this kind of engagement with decision makers. And so we interviewed 23 people in total in the second phase. Of those, we interviewed five knowledge brokers, 10 academic leaders, some of which overlap in their roles as knowledge brokers. So in total, academics, we, met, we spoke to 12. And then at the national level, we spoke to 11 policymakers. So I won't share the, the data that came out of the qualitative phase because I don't think I have time for that. But particularly on the SNA, I'll show you what we found. So this is an example of what the network map looks like for one particular university. So this was the Kenyatta University School of Public Health. Anyone in the Fuchsia, I think, and apologies to those that may have visual impairments in being able to see or distinguish the colors on this map. But those that are in Fuchsia Pink are academic faculty at the Kenyatta University School of Public Health. Any node that's a different color is a decision maker. And those that are of the same color belong to the same ministry. So for example, everyone in light blue is a different decision maker, but they may all be um, housed within a ministry of health versus everyone in yellow might be a ministry of water. So that's what this map looks like, for example. And, and those that evolved at, or that appear as knowledge brokers are the ones that you see that are large pink circles with a black box around them. So what we found is that there were some faculty that were externally influential, so they had high out degree, but they didn't appear as having high in degree or appear as knowledge brokers. So they were externally influential, but not really internally trusted. We also found those circled in blue uh, are faculty that had lots of arrows into them from faculty that, though, that, that they were supportive of them as um, trusted advisors, but they didn't seem to have too many connections with government. And then we had our knowledge brokers. And so we mapped this out for all the universities individually. But then we aggregated that data and looked across the universities, where are these connections looking like at an institutional level? And what we found was really, really interesting, particularly as we think about the intersect of health with other, um, with other sectors. And we found that across Kenya, Academics in schools of public health were connected to 16 ministries in total, but each school of public health was connected to six, between six and 10 ministries, which to me was personally quite surprising. I expected, as you would see in the red circles here, that of course they would all be connected to, at the time with two ministries, Ministry of Public Health and a Ministry of Medical Services. And so I assume that of course they're all gonna be connected to those two ministries, and they were, all of them were connected to these two ministries. But it was really encouraging to see this diversity of connections across sectors. We found of course that some universities had monopoly relationships. So for example, what we see on the left side here, the Great Lakes University of Kenya was the only one that mentioned that they had connections at the Ministry of Water or with the Prime Minister's office. And the Kenya Methodist University on the right hand side you'll see was the only one connected to the Ministry of ICT. Um, what we did find, however, was also that there were some monopoly relationships. And in those um, relationships, we were, um, we could see that uh, 
Oh, sorry. I've already talked about the monopoly relationships. I got distracted by a quick uh, Skype uh, message here. Sorry about that. We also found that there were overlapping or shared connections across the universities. So the question then here, you know, it, it raises is, while there is competitive advantage in influencing decision making, is there opportunity for more collaborative engagement and providing a unified voice when trying to influence decision making so that ministries don't have every university and every academic knocking down their door, but that there would be a coalition of sorts to be able to influence decision making on similar interests. Um, so by default, the SNA was starting to raise other questions that we thought might be um, better suited for another study or a more qualitative aspect of the study. And so here's the distribution of knowledge brokers across the six universities. Um, we found seven knowledge brokers, as I mentioned, four within schools of public health, um, and had lots of potential, what we were calling potential KBs, across all six schools of public health. And so here's just uh, one slide to show the distribution of all the KBs within these four schools and the networks and what they look like. And there they are circled in red, if it's not too clear. And then what we also wanted to see is how do you measure really the strength of these relationships quantitatively um, in terms of the range, in terms of their size, the prevalence, the depth, and the breadth of these relationships. Um, and what we found was no one indicator really placed any one university at the top um, for, for some of these. Some may have a greater range and diversity of relationships. Some have, may have more relationships. Some may have an overlap, so more of their faculty have relationships with, with the same decision makers. And that was also important us, for us to know in terms of the resistance, um, or, or sorry, the, the resilience of some of these networks. So if you lose a faculty member, have you lost uh, that part of the network? Have you lost a connection? Or do you have a more institutionalized form of connections that allow, allow a university to continue its influence irrespective of an individual? So, you know, this was bridging the institutional versus the individual. And so even though I'm not going to talk about the qualitative aspect, there are a couple of quotes that I thought were extremely interesting and that came from some of our, our studies. And one is this one here that you might, it might resonate with many of you, is that on top, in, in, in terms of relationships, the most important one, of course, is the one-on-one -on -one connection. So if you know somebody at a certain government department or ministry, and they know me, and they know my capabilities, they could quickly pick up the phone and say, we are doing this. Can you join us on this in this day? And, and, and that's what someone from the Kenya Methodist University said was really critical for them to be able to be responsive to some of the needs at the ministry. And so in summary, we found that in this particular study, that SNA was actually a very useful tool to map the location and the distribution of academic expertise, the SPH connections to ministries as well as others, to enhance visibility or to make the invisible KBs visible, um, and, and for us to be able to recognize who can we leverage at the university to, to help with some of these relationships. But also what was important to identify the gaps. So some schools were like, oh, we didn't realize that we don't have relationships with certain ministries, or we didn't realize that our sister universities also have connections. What can we do about this? Um, we also found that the SNA was able to um, uh, confirm that academic KBs do exist, at least in the Kenyan public health context, each with their own distinct networks, and that these networks are diverse with over, over, uh, overlapping and complementary relationships, but others with unique monopolies. And so, you know, this is another quote. As I sign off, I'd like to share that what, you know, another member in our interview said that it's really important to build a staircase of convincing people to change a policy. You don't carry out the burden as if it's your own. It has to be shared. And that's why networks and multiple approaches are so important to change policy. So the implications are many in terms of academia and in government, and I can leave that up for you to read given that we have very little time for questions and answers, and obviously there's also limitations to the study, which I'm happy to speak about maybe in the Q&A period, um, but that's really the summary of this study and, and what implications it may have both for academia, but also the government or maybe media or think tanks or whoever the stakeholder is or whoever it is that we're hoping to build partnerships with or influence at any one point in time. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. 
So um, if you go back to showing us your, so we can see you, and I'll invite the two panellists, other panellists to come up here, and then we'll face you. All right. <laughs> um, we haven't got much time left for questions, but um, we have got 15 minutes. So um, I thought just first we could check if we've got any, anyone online who's asked anything. Um, I'm not going to... No, not at the moment. Okay, so we've heard a lot about knowledge brokers and hybrid, hybrid knowledge brokers and powerful connectors. Um, but I'm, I'm going to first ask if anyone here has any questions for anyone on the panel. Yes, could you say who you are? Thank you. I'm Lakshmi from India. Uh, I'm a visiting fellow at IDS. Uh, firstly, thank, uh, thanks to three of you for this insightful presentation. It seems fascinating, but at the same time, a lot to unpack immediately within half an hour. Uh, it all seems uh, well when you project it on a graphical scale in relational terms. Uh, what is the use of such knowledge? Uh, how, how can it benefit? Uh, because in most of the sciences, things become easier to translate when you have a measurable metric is there any metrics to measure such social network? I mean, what are those metrics? Is there a relationship between those metrics, like some cited funding, resource mapping, as certain parameters? Are they metrics, or do they have a hierarchy? That's my question. Thank you. Uh, so that are, uh, you know, Yes, there are lots and lots and lots of metrics. Um, I think all of us at some point have talked about one or uh, centrality and different forms of centrality and what that means. Centrality is probably one of the most basic uh, metrics in, in, in social network analysis. Um, you can look, you can, there are metrics for uh, describing the whole network, like the density of, uh, of a network, down to, uh, or on the nodal level, like centrality, or there are even scores for brokerage. Um, so uh, I think the, the, the three of us, we didn't come here going all out with the, the graph theory um, that's behind social network analysis because of probably because of the audience. Uh, but I, I can safely say there's, there, there is a hell of a lot out there um, uh, on that. Um, but so I think I think I'm speaking for all of us when I say this is a, a taste uh, of just of the of what the approach can bring. But there are there really are lot, you know, lots of different metrics out there, and not just to describe. Uh, but also to you know to to go past description and to maybe sort of start to test theories. Um, so you know it, you you can find that something is central, but does centrality, centrality correlate with an outcome um, that you would might find in more traditional statistical analysis? Um, the, the, there are lots of very interesting methods out there, and not just to look at one time period, but also to look at network change and evolution. So uh, you know, not just and again, it's not just measures um, uh, about particular nodes or about the structure of a network, but things like homophily. Are people more more or less likely to share resources or to associate with people that share the same attribute? You know, there's so much out there which we could maybe talk about after the uh, after the session. Okay, thanks, George. Glad. Anything to add to that, Nazarene? Uh, no, I think that's great. I think. Um Geographically and complement that also with qualitative studies. So um, there is a lot we can do when exploring SNA, and it may not be obviously the appropriate methodology for all questions, but for some questions, it really is the natural um, method that one can explore. So, and I think Jordan explained explain that quite well. 
Yes, one here. Hi, uh, my name is Alban Massaparisi. Uh, I work at FAO on a program uh, aiming to influence agricultural policy with evidence. And I'm also doing a, a PhD on the political economy of evidence-based policy in Ethiopia. Um, so I have a question um, which is related to my research interests as well. Is uh, w whether any of the panelists were able to kind of map and characterize the flows of risk of knowledge, sorry, or evidence between the nodes, because I think a lot of the discussion has been on the nodes and who is a knowledge broker and the attributes of the nodes. But I'm wondering whether you've been able to research the kind of the, the flows or, or the translation of knowledge between the nodes and kind of uh, knows what type of knowledge, kind of assign attributes to the knowledge that flows between these nodes what kind of knowledge, uh, quantitative versus qualitative field of uh, research. So that's, that's my question. I have other questions, but maybe I'll stay with that one right now. Okay, I'm gonna take a couple, so we've got, and then we'll ask them all together. So there's one online, you can hear that was. And I will come to you. Uh, this comes from Rochelle. Uh, what opportunities do you see for SNA in the practice of development, i.e. by development practitioners and aid workers? And what are the barriers and how do we overcome them? Okay, and then there's one here. We'll take all three because of the time and then we'll get the panel to respond to all three. Yep. Hi, I'm Colin Poulton from SAS. Um, question for Louise. It's quite a specific question, and I'm not quite sure where I'm going with it. But um, when you were looking at your interactions at your workshop, you had one point where you were asking if people had had conversations which they thought would lead to something. Um, and it struck me that if that's a conversation between two people, what if one person said it was likely to lead something and the other person didn't? Do you have ways, nice visual tools for mapping sort of asymmetric relationships in your network like that? Okay, so what I'm going to ask the panel to do, uh, I'd like us to answer all three questions but um, you don't necessarily have to answer all three yourself. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start with, with this really excellent question from the gentleman from FAO on, on, on the flow of knowledge as opposed to the attributes of the nodes. Um, Louise? Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, I've got a mic, haven't I? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. And, um, you know, one of my mantras is it's about the arrows. It's all about the arrows. It's, um, but, um, and, there's a, uh, and there's a bit of an art form in, in trying to find, you know, what is the right question. And it depends very much on your, the methodology and how you're generating your data. So in the example that I showed, you know, it was very much connections, how you know someone. Did you know them before? How do, you know, have you spoken? Have you emailed? Have you heard of their work? Um, my PhD was in the agricultural field and um, you know so we basically codified so it was all about information flows between farmers and extension and between different agencies um, and we codified so market information versus technical information versus you know seeds technologies um, I mean one of the challenges there it, it it very quickly gets repetitive, and I think to kind of reiterate the point that Nazreen made, it's not the right method for everything. Uh, but yes, it's it's all about the data that you you know, like any good study, it's all about the the data that you feed in is is what you feed out. But you could start to look at networks that form around different types of um, of flows. But that's all about how you, your research design essentially. Um, Jordan, I thought you might have a view on that flow, because you mentioned that you kind of didn't look at it as a flow of information or knowledge. You kind of talked about it being a sort of slightly disconnected network. Um, I, I think what I, what I was, when, when I was saying that it's, uh, I mean, I have a problem with the term flow sometimes because it, it, it makes it, it feels that information is, uh, that the networks that you have are, are, are pipes. Uh, when actually when we exchange information, there's always uh, you know, the act of translation um, is is an act of distortion. You know, uh, I'm not. I'm definitely not the first person to say that. But um, but and quantitatively, are you going to pick that up? Probably not. Um, we can be aware of it. So in, in my networks, I could say, oh, it does seem that 
quantitative economic uh, actors are the most important sources of knowledge. Um, can I show how the information flowed through the, through the network uh, quantitatively? I'm yet to find something that would allow me to do that, but still taking it, and when I say social network analysis, I don't just mean p-values, numbers, and um, lines and dots. You have to get to the, the meaning structure of the network. You have to get to the lived experience, the history, and the culture of that network. And you, you can only do that through more, you know, what we might see as more bread and butter traditional methods. But still, you're, but you're putting the relationship as the, the, as the, as the, as the focus. Um, and that's where you can, you can start to see how this information flows. Um, yeah. So, um, Nazarene, I'm just going to ask you if you'd like to, it's a very big question, what are the opportunities for development from, but, but would you like to give us uh, one minute on where you see a particular opportunity for the application of this in a development context based on your own, uh, your own sector or area of expertise? Thanks, Nazarene. That was really good. Uh, unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time, and, and I apologise for that, but um, mm -hmm. we did have... Oh, we've got one more point from Louise. Uh, I'd just like to add, in terms of the, the barriers, that this, because it is so visual, it can be very, very powerful. So, there, you know, there is always a kind of take it with a, with a pinch of salt. And, and when we're talking around power dynamics, you can, you can aggravate by demonstrating either who's in the middle or who's outside. So, you know, the, 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 the ethics of this is, is really very important in, in, um, in development settings. I kind of can't emphasize it enough. So just wanted to make sure that point was made. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a really important point, and um, and I think yeah, I think that focus on its potential. For, it, it strikes me at IDS we have such a long-standing history in thinking about power, uh, power in relation to um, whose knowledge counts, and I think there is huge scope to apply. Uh, some of these approaches um, to further investigating some of those issues but yes as Louise says not without some challenges um, so I'm going to finish by uh, thanking our panel all three of them thank you very much round of applause for the panel please um, 
We have been tweeting links to their work, so do have a look and you will find those links. And then a quick advert from me. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, this is part of a series. Uh, the next of these seminars will be on the 24th of July and uh, we'll be looking at um, uh, how you can upscale your organisation or your institution's use of research to influence policy and practice. And we have still putting the panel together, but it will include Ruth Main from Oxfam. And there's also a short course. This is probably less relevant to the people in the room, but it might be relevant to people out there uh, or watching us online. Our next, uh, uh, the next um, uh, opportunity to join the IDS short course on engaging evidence and policy for social change will be towards the end of July and applications are currently open and it's a fantastic three-day residential course. So thank you very much and thank you to the panel and goodbye. Thank you.